book of Ezekiel. In chapter 4, and I guess it's been three weeks. So you say, what were we looking at? Well, let's read the first seven verses, and maybe that will help prick some thoughts in your mind. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. And lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Like thou also, lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that, that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety, so shall thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year." Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. Last time, which was the 17th of January, we looked at verse 7, began dealing with verse 7. And we saw that he was to set his face toward the besieged Jerusalem. That portrait of a city being besieged. And that portrait was of Jerusalem. Set thy face. Specifically, we said that that meant to, to be firm, to be established, Fixed, in other words, to be wholly intent upon looking <laughs> to the besieged Jerusalem, all the while laying on his left side for 390 days. And I stress that, and it'll become evident later on, I trust. And then he was to turn on his right side as well, all, and still facing the besieged city, Jerusalem. And to portray, just as the Babylonian army, the Chaldeans, would be set against Jerusalem, because this was what the picture was, a city under besieged, and that the, the besieging was by the Chaldean army, Nebuchadnezzar. Remember we said, so must God's servants be. That is, they must be set just as Ezekiel was to be set towards the besieged city of Jerusalem, God's servants, God's men, whatever God has called you to do, called I to do, we're to be set in that towards that goal that God has given us. We looked at 
Samuel, in the book of 1 Samuel, he was to be set in the work of the Lord, and Samuel was. We looked at 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and in and, and chapter 27 and, and saw also some more setting. We saw that Ezra, in chapter 7 of Ezra, Ezra was set in the work of the Lord. We also brought out how that how the Nebuchadnezzar's anger would have been really turned against Zedekiah. Because remember, we said that, that Nebuchadnezzar and Zedekiah had entered into a pact. Zedekiah agreed to it and agreed, agreed to be faithful to Nebuchadnezzar. And he broke that pact. And you can just imagine this proud Nebuchadnezzar, this king of the Chaldeans, king of Babylon, with a mighty army and conquering much of the known area at that time. The anger that he would have had towards Zedekiah and the, and the people, the rest of the people as well. And, he, and so he would have been very determined to lay siege against Jerusalem. Now, recognizing that all of this is of the Lord, the Lord, the Lord used Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, uh, I believe it's in Isaiah talks about, about them being the messengers of the Lord, them being the servants of the Lord. The Lord used Nebuchadnezzar to accomplish his purpose against Jerusalem. The we talked about the uncovered arm that is mentioned in the, in the verses. The uncovered arm, and remember what we said that was to demonstrate. That was to to demonstrate strength, but not only strength, but blows. <laughs> against the city, blows against Jerusalem, and that without mercy. We read a couple of scriptures from the book of Isaiah and one from the book of Psalms. Talked about the arm of the Lord being bared forth in wrath and in judgment and condemnation. And so it, was, it pictured Nebuchadnezzar and his mighty army and the blows that were, were dealt against Jerusalem, but not only did it picture Nebuchadnezzar and the mighty armies, but it pictured the arm of God being made bare against his beloved city, Jerusalem. That was the introduction. Then remember we covered the first point, which was, was that this was to be a sign. All this that, that Ezekiel was to do, and all of it in this fourth chapter, was to be a sign. It was to be a sign to the house of Israel. That's not strange in the Word of God. We looked at, at several scriptures. We looked at, we looked at the, the sign which God put upon Cain. A sign of protection. 
against Cain because Cain said that his punishment was more than he could bear and he said that if any man saw him it would rise up against him and, and slay him and so the Lord put a sign upon him that if any man brought harm to Cain the Lord's wrath would be put against them we look at the sign of the rainbow in the sky after the flood. We looked at the sign of the blood sprinkled upon the doorpost and the lentils in the Passover. So the scriptures full of signs, things that were given for signs back then. It was a sign to not only to you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. It was a sign to those who were in the Babylonian captivity. That's where Ezekiel was. And and his ministry was amongst the captives there in Babylon, there in Ur of the Chaldees. But not only, not only to them, as there was still travel back and forth from Jerusalem to Babylon, not, so it was not only to those captives in Babylon, those who had been taken captive there, but it was assigned to those back in Jerusalem who were left there. To repent. <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord is bringing judgment upon us because of our sin. I don't know if I said it then or not, but the thought crosses the mind again. What about God's people here in good old U.S. of A? Amen. What about our sin? And folks, we have to say we have sinned. We're, we're not where we were 50 years ago. We're not where we were 65 years ago. Our not being there, is it to the better? <laughs> no, it's to the worse. And these things in, in the Old Testament dealing with Israel, with God's people, with Jerusalem. What did 1 Corinthians 10 say it is to us? It's an example unto us. And we're just closing a blind eye to it and we're following in the path That is real following. <coughs> Brings us, catches us up to point. Still, still dealing with our thought from the main point, number four, which is from verse 7, which is he was to be fixed, he was to be set toward besieged Jerusalem. The first point under that point was this was to be a sign to the house of Israel. The second we begin tonight with is also in this, in these jesters and in this picture Ezekiel prophesies against Jerusalem. He, he said in verse 7 there, he said, And thine arm shall be 
uh, uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against Jerusalem. Not, <coughs> not necessarily with the words of his mouth, but in the, in the portrait that he was picturing, and, and all that he was doing, and all these signs, and all these gestures that he was doing. He was prophesying. <coughs> prophesying against Jerusalem. You say, well, why, why not, why not have him speak with words as he, as he does his men today? Why, why in signs? Why in pictures? Why in portraits? Well, I'm not so much that way, but some people. They get more out of a portrait than they do sitting and listening to somebody talk. I can look at a portrait and somebody say, see that, see that? No, I, I don't see that. <laughs> you know, I just, I don't have that kind of mind. I don't, I don't see that. But a lot of people do. So the case could be made that some sometimes we we think longer. In fact, you 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 <laughs> you go into an art museum sometime, yeah. especially one with that's loaded with portraits, and you watch people. And they're studying them. And they're thinking long and hard upon those portraits. They're giving more thought to, to that portrait than they ever would to one who was proclaiming. That's why I like to hear, but I like to see too. I don't know the statistics anymore at one time I knew. But that which you hear, such as tonight, you retain very little. And it jumps drastically when you see it with your eyes. <laughs> Of course, then when you experience it as being taught by the Holy Spirit of God, it, get, it, gets, it gets in here. And, and as long as you keep refreshing yourself in it, it don't get away. These people... They, re they had rejected the prophets. What was it, what did the prophet do? The prophet came with the word of the Lord. He came speaking the word of the Lord with their mouth. They had rejected the prophets. They had they had had persecuted the prophets. They had slain the prophets. Our preliminary study to. Give, get us up to the times of Ezekiel's word. We covered that. But this portrait, this portrait that Ezekiel was drawing and, and staging around that city, those people would get that. They'd know exactly what Ezekiel was saying to him, to them, in picture, in portrait. Thirdly, as we consider this thought of him lying on his left side, 
and then on his right side, and whether it left or right, all the while his face being set toward, fixed towards, intent upon the besieged city, we can could make the case, if we think about it, we could make the case that, that he might have had good reason to, to hesitate to be obedient. Sure. Think about if the Lord came to you and told you to do something like that. We could say he'd have, have pretty good reason to hesitate at it and, and even find exception against it. Yeah, but, 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 you know. <laughs> Lord, you can't expect me to, you really can't expect me. I mean, I might be able to keep my face set towards Jerusalem, but not, not all the while I'm lying there for 390 days. That's over a year. How many of you like doing the same thing over and over again? Come on, be honest. There aren't very many people that like change. We like we like our ritual. That's our comfort zone. Yeah, we like our routine. But that's carrying it a little bit too far, isn't it? Every day for 390 days, going out there, laying down on your side, and laying there and having your face set intent upon a besieged city. But. Ezekiel was obedient. In obedience to God's command and in execution of his office. And notice, I said obedient first. He had to be obedient in order to execute his office. Remember what his office was? <laughs> his watchman. He was made a watchman to the house of Israel. What was a watchman to do? Sound out the warning. Only Ezekiel is not to sound out the warning with his mouth. Not, not yet. Anyhow. He's to do it with his portrait. And he did just as he was instructed to do. Now, he might have even thought it seemed childish and ludicrous, maybe even beneath him, as most of us would think. But he feared the Lord. Did you get that? He feared the Lord. And because he feared the Lord, that is because he stood in awe of the Lord, because he stood in reverence to the Lord, and because of who the Lord was. He had a fear for him too. Knowing that the Lord could render punishment to him for not being obedient and get someone else to do his bidding. That's a key point for you and I to remember. I know you're thinking about it. I think about it often. 
somebody asked me, I would say, yeah, I fear the Lord. But at times I sat and I wonder, do I really fear the Lord? Do I really stand in awe? Do I really stand in reverence of the Lord? If I do, that kind of fear produces obedience. Not disobedience. Then why am I so much of the time disobedient? Turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes and Yes, chapter 12. In verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Stand in awe of God. Stand in reverence of God. And because of who he is, have a, a fear, a holy fear for him. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Listen, if we fear the Lord as, as the word signifies a means, we will obey his commandments. We will keep his commandments. In case I didn't give it to you, that was Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 6. In verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments. Listen, what did that just say that I just read in, in verse 2 there? That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his... Listen, if you don't fear the Lord your God, you're not going to keep his commandments. And his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Not only that, the implication is there in that verse that not only are we obeying the commandments of the Lord because of the fear of the Lord that is, is in us, but we're teaching it unto our children and to our, their children. Amen. And somehow, somewhere along the line, we got the mindset that once our children reached adulthood, our responsibility was over. And you're not finding that in the Word of God. And it continues on as long as the days that you, you live upon this earth. You're to teach them to your children, to your children's children, and to their children. And Joseph, in the book of Genesis in chapter 50, he lived to be 110 years old, and he saw his children's children to the third generation. And he didn't say once, once his two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, were grown up, his responsibility was done. He continued to teach and to instruct, and to teach and instruct their children and their children. And that's our responsibility, to continue to instruct our children. It takes on a, a different avenue, and we can't do it like we did when they lived in our home, but we can still instruct them, and we can instruct our grandchildren. 
and if we're privileged to have great-grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And if we're privileged, our great-great-grandchildren. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. And oh, by the way, I'll just throw this in here. Children? And who's that? All of a sudden here. Don't think that because mom and dad are offering some good sound advice that they're meddling where they don't belong. I just read to you from the Word of God, they do have a right to offer you that good sound of advice, and you have the responsibility to heed it if it is good sound advice. Yeah, I just toss that in. That's free tonight. We won't charge you for that tonight. Psalms 111. That's another message too, by the way. I think that's a message I had ready to preach over at Bible Baptist and didn't get the opportunity. So the Lord, may, the Lord had me develop it for some reason. It just wasn't his time yet. But someday. Verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding has... All they that do his commandments. A good understanding. A good understanding of what? A good understanding of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and 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 a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. So when we're disobedient to the Lord, do we have a good understanding of who the Lord is? Not according to that verse. His praise endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Oh, that took, <laughs> oh. You ever find yourself groaning because the word of the Lord says this? Well, I guess I better do it. What did verse 1 say? That he delighteth in them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that keep his commandments. A good understanding of who the Lord is. Who is the Lord? He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's got a love, grace, mercy. Oh, we delight on that. We love <laughs> the omnis of God. Well, think about the first one omnipotent. Has all power. Amen. But somehow we translate that power only in love, grace, and mercy, right? <clears throat> but he's a God of wrath also. And he has the power to administer it. 
Now I know when he is saved that he's not going to he's not going to be wrathful in condemnation. But there is a there is payment for sin. Even after we're corrected and, and, and exhorted and, and, and chastened. Ask David. He was instructed. He was exhorted. He, he, was, he was chastened. You say, how was he chastened? You don't think the loss of that child was a chase, wasn't a chastening of the Lord? But then he paid the rest of the days of his life. Yes, God forgave him. And he pleaded with God. I believe he pleaded with God there, there in, in, in uh, 2 Samuel. I believe he pleaded with God. What was it? Is it the 14th chapter? And he wept bitterly in, in, in ashes and sackcloth. And I believe he was pleading with God to, to be merciful and to spare that child. He said, how do I, how do I know that? Because he, because he told him, he said, while the child was alive, yet alive, was there not hope that maybe God would be merciful? And then when he died, he got rid of the sackcloth and ashes and clothes and commanded food to be brought. And they couldn't, they couldn't understand that. He said, he's gone to the Lord. He said, he can't return, but I can go to him. Amen. It was a wearisome and tedious job that God had given Ezekiel to do, but he was obedient in it. Serving God demands the sacrifice of self. Ezekiel, we're going to see in his obedience, he sacrificed self. The apostles sacrificed self. Paul, an apostle, sacrificed self. In fact, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, He said, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things to serve the Lord. That's what he's talking about. To serve the Lord and be pleasing in his sight. Be obedient. Is temperate in all things. In other words, he exercises self-control in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. He's talking about that crown which is laid up for us. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body. And I, I have mar I've underlined that. I keep under my body. I've underlined that, and I'm out to the side. I wrote the, the meaning, the, the Hebrew, the Greek meaning uh, of that word there, and it means literally to, to beat back black and blue. Paul said literally, there's times I have to beat this fleshly body black and blue. To keep it in the subjection. Why? That he might be a vessel of glory unto God. Unless that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That is not approved of God. We want our deeds and our actions Approved of God, don't we? 
the only way they're going to be approved of God is, is to do what God would have us to do. You see, the service of God is not tedious. It's not laborious to the spiritual man, to the child of God, the one who's truly born again of God. What is it that John tells us? Uh, well, I should say, what is it that God tells us through his servant John in the first Epistle of John chapter 5 verse 2 he said by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments when we love God and keep his commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous you know what that word grievous means in the Greek? They're not heavy. They're not weighty. They're not burdensome. Do you find it a burden? A heavy weight? To obey God? Ah, oh, Jerusalem. Ezekiel is saying by the portrait. He's saying, Ah, Jerusalem, the city of God, the holy city. And he foretells, he prophesies of its ruin, of its destruction. Close with this passage in the book of Matthew in comparison to what we have there in Ezekiel. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 36. Jesus said, Verily ver I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her ch chickens under her wings, and ye would not. And he says this after he pronounced the woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees. And he goes on to say, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! And then he pronounces judgment. Pronounces the wrath of God against Jerusalem. And she was destroyed and the temple destroyed. In what, 70 A.D.? has never been rebuilt. Going to be rebuilt one day. <laughs> See? All of that, right up to the days of Christ and, and, and the destruction of the temple and, and the city of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. was why? Because of their sin. 